in coming on this morning. Um, good morning and a warm welcome to our webinar on financial planning during COVID-19. My name is Mark Parkinson and I'm a partner at MHA Tate Walker Wealth Management. This is our first live webinar, uh, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. And we aim for the session to last no longer than 45 minutes today, because I'm, I'm sure some of you may have been on webinars or, or sessions like this over recent weeks. And uh, the feedback that we've received is 30 to 45 minutes uh, is about right. So firstly, and I guess most importantly, I hope this finds you all in good health and coping with the challenges <laughs> that this surreal and unprecedented situation we find ourselves in. For us, it's business as usual, and we're doing all we can to provide our clients with the service they're used to. I know this morning we've got some of our existing clients joining us. And we've also got people that aren't clients of the firm. So welcome to everybody and thank you for, for taking the time to come on this session. MHA Tate Walker Wealth Management is part of MHA Tate Walker Chartered Accountants and we have six offices. As a firm, we employ 165 staff and 30 of which work in the wealth management team. Of the 30 staff in the wealth management team, we have 13 financial planners who provide advice to our clients and they're supported by a team of 17 technical and administration staff. I guess it is a bit different this morning as we, we have been working from home. However, today I'm joined by Jeff Kavanagh and Leonard Burney and we are all in our Gosforth office today. We are socially distancing and we're working and delivering this webinar from separate offices. Jeff and Leonard are both chartered financial planners and provide financial planning advice to a portfolio of existing clients. I guess we're all living through something we didn't expect to experience and are worrying about our own and family's health is only natural. Equally, there are very few of us that we won't, that won't have concerns about our own finances and the general economy. Unfortunately, we're not able to provide coffee or biscuits this morning. So hopefully you've arranged for some yourself and you're sitting comfortably for the next 45 minutes. I'm going to hand over to Jeff shortly, who will be giving you some ideas and tips about reviewing your finances during COVID-19. And then Jeff will hand over to Leonard, who will comment on the impact of COVID-19 on your retirement plans. After Leonard, it'll be back to me and I'll host a Q&A session. We have had a question in already, uh, which may get answered throughout the session this morning. However, if during the session you do have a question uh, that you crops up and you're thinking of when listening to the speakers, just type it into the chat box which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try and answer them at the end. If we do get too many questions, or there's some that may be better answered later, what we'll do is come back to you directly, and we'll also do that if we get a question that relates to maybe some specific personal circumstances. So introduction over, that's enough from me. I'm now gonna hand over to Jeff, and he will get the ball rolling and look at reviewing your finances during COVID-19. Thank you, Mark. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Jeff Kavanagh, and I'm a chartered financial planner in our wealth management team. Um, so as Mike says, I'm going to be covering off, looking at your finances and reviewing them in the current climate. Please get the next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, so firstly, financial planning in the current climate. So I think the main thing uh, with the environment we found ourselves in is it's given us all time and it's made us stop and think um, about all different aspects of our lives. Um, one of those will be your finances. And also for many of us, it's given us time, uh, time to think, time to do those jobs that we've not got around to. Uh, I know I've ended up doing many jobs around the house. Um, one of those jobs as well 
would be reviewing your finances. So now's an ideal time to kind of get a good firm grip on where you're at and give yourself a bit of a financial health check. We get the next slide, please. So what I'll be covering off in my slides is just very high level, but just some things you can be doing now at this time to put yourself in a good position. Uh, and as I say, get a good firm grip on your finances and where you're currently at. So the things I'll be looking at is reviewing your income and expenditure, um, reassessing your goals and priorities, reviewing any current and historic pension arrangements, understanding your state pension, uh, reviewing your protection policies, and reviewing or writing a will if you don't have one. So I'll cover off all these areas. As Mark says, if you've got any questions as we go along, then feel free to type them in the chat box uh, and we can pick those up at the end. Can we get the next slide, please? So review income and expenditure. So this is probably more important than ever. Um, and it's really important that you know of your expenditure, what is essential and what is non-essential expenditure. So that's your essential expenditure. How much do you need to survive? So what's that minimum income you require to know I need this to pay my bills, to feed my family, okay? And then you've got your non-essential expenditure. So they're nice to have, okay? And it's just understanding what those are. And that may have changed recently, but it's really important to know what those are. So in a current climate like this, you know where you're at, you know what minimum income you need, um, and that just gives you a really good starting point for your financial plan, okay? Then going from there, do you need to make any changes? So at the moment, some people may be furloughed. They may be withdrawing less from their business if they're a business owner. So are there any direct debits coming out, any monthly costs that actually you're perhaps not using at the moment or anywhere where you could make some changes or if, certainly if you need to? On the other side of that, there may be a position where you find yourself actually, you've got your normal income coming in, but because of the environment we're currently in, you can't go out and socialize, you can't do the things you enjoy. You might not be actually spending anywhere near as much as you normally would, meaning that surplus income on a monthly basis is a lot higher. So if you find yourself in that position, actually now is an ideal time to perhaps look at increasing some of your regular savings. So the amount you're directing into pension and ISAs, um, having a look at that, as I say, saving for the longer term, and just making use of that surplus you've got on a monthly basis. What will this look like in the future? Um, and that's really important. Yes, you want to understand your expenditure requirements now, but also having some sight in terms of how much am I gonna need in the future? Uh, what of this expenditure will continue into retirement? Uh, and this just all starts to help you build up a financial plan and which Leonard will talk more about. I'll get the next slide, please. So reassess goals and priorities. So I think now for everybody, as I said at the start, this current situation, it's given everybody a lot of time to think, um, reassess what they're doing with their lives now, but also in the future and what's most important to them. And for some, their priorities certainly may have changed. Um, and if, for instance, say now this whole situation has made you think, actually, I want to retire earlier, um, or I want to do more holidays in retirement when we can travel again, um, then does your financial plan need to be adapted? Um, you know, does this leave you still on track? If you are looking to retire earlier, what changes do you need to make to your financial plan to ensure you're on track? Uh, and again, Leonard will talk about this, but just to see what impact the current situation uh, has had on people's longer term plans and how they can address those um, if there are changes. We'll get the next slide, please. Yeah, so review current and historic pension arrangements. So I think as people go through their career, you, know, you accumulate pensions, you know, one with standard life, one with Scottish widows from your different workplaces. Um, and that's only going to increase as we've now got auto enrollment where all employers have to enroll staff into a workplace. So wherever you work, you'll definitely get a pension. So it's really important to understand what you have. I know for many people, the annual statement comes in, it gets put in the filing cabinet and forgotten about. Now's an ideal time 
to get those statements out, have a look at those pensions you've got, um, and then start to understand what you've got. You know, are you taking the right amount of risk with those pensions? Are they perhaps taking too much risk? Um, are they invested in old funds that perhaps aren't performing as well as they were when that pension was set up? And it just comes back to your financial plan and understanding what you've got. Um, because it's great to have a financial plan, but you need to understand what you've got and any changes that need to be made to that to ensure you're on track. In terms of the amount you're contributing, again, this is something Lend will cover off, but making sure you're actually contributing the right amount. So yes, it's good to be paying into a pension, but what's the longer term plan with that? Are you contributing enough to provide yourself with the retirement you want? Um, so that's something really uh, worth looking at at the present time. One final thing as well, especially when we come to legacy pensions, um, there's been huge changes to pensions in terms of the way you can access them in retirement. In 2015, big changes came in that gave us a lot more flexibility about how we can access our pension benefits. A lot of legacy pensions don't allow you to use these new rules. So when you've got all these legacy pensions, it's really good to try and understand if you can actually use the new rules or whether you need to consider a new pension contract so you can get the full benefits that are now available. Next slide, please. So understanding your state pension. Now, the state pension, often I see this, it's a really overlooked part of the financial plan. You know, an income um, for the full state pension of £175.20 a week, that's providing an annual income just over £9,000 per annum that's indexed, linked and guaranteed. So when you're looking at retirement and planning for retirement, actually, especially if you're looking at a couple, you know, there's over £18,000 of guaranteed income coming in at that point. So that makes a huge difference to what you need to save personally to provide you with that income you want in retirement. So understanding what your current entitlement to a state pension is is really important. So you need to have 35 qualifying years of national insurance contributions to be entitled to the full state pension. Now, it's really worthwhile, especially as you're near retirement, getting a projection to see if you've got that full state pension. And you can do that by going online um, on the YouGov website and searching for state pension forecast. And it will show you there what your current entitlement is. And then if there's any shortfall, how much more contributions you need to make to get to that full entitlement. Um, and as I say, uh, just over £9,000 per annum, that's a solid integral part of any financial plan. So I'd say definitely, uh, if you haven't already, have a look at where you stand with your state pension. Get the next slide, please. Review protection policies. So when I say protection policies, this is things like life cover policies, critical illness, income protection. So protecting you and your family when the unexpected happens. Um, many of us, we take out a life cover policy with a mortgage, it's aligned to that, and then it gets forgotten about. So now's a really good time to get those policies together, see what you've got, and then assess actually how much do I need? So how much cover do I need that if something should happen to me, that there's cover in place for my family to ensure that they've got enough to survive and live the life that they want to. But often you find that cover you took out years ago perhaps is no longer at the right level um, and you may need additional cover. So get those policies together, see what you have, see again, do I need to make any changes? Do I need more cover? Have I got too much? <laughs> Certainly something worth doing at this time. If I get the next slide, please. Review or write a will. So again, when I work speaking with clients, this is one of those areas where people tend to leave this as one of those jobs I'll get around to doing. Not today, I'll do another time. Um, but And it is perhaps it's because it's such a morbid subject, but it is so important, um, not only for you, but for your loved ones and executives, making sure there's a valid update will in place takes away an awful lot of hassle and stress um, for them. And also, if potentially your estate has an inheritance tax liability, by making sure you've got uh, a will that will distribute your estate efficiently, it could make a huge difference to the tax position. So as I say, yes, it is a morbid subject, 
but certainly something if you haven't done get it done and if it is um, in place already ensure it's up to date because as life happens there's changes and sometimes there does need to be amendments made to your will just to ensure it accurately reflects your wishes can i get the next slide please so stay safe and be aware of scams. So I just wanted to add this last slide in. Just with any crisis, often you find there's unscrupulous characters that will look to take advantage and benefit from the situation. And COVID-19 is no different. Um, certainly we've seen a number of scams, text messages, emails. Um, you know, across the, the country, people have received. Um, and I'll just say, you know, be aware. If something seems too good to be true, Often it is, especially when it's coming from an unsolicited environment, a text message out of nowhere. Just stop, think, you know, challenge it as it says there. Um, you know, if someone's rushing you to give information, if there's a deadline somewhere, you know, suddenly out of nowhere, just stop and think and, and maybe go back to it. Um, and just protect yourself. If you have given your details out or financial information, just make sure you contact the relevant people, as um, like your bank, for instance. Um, so, yeah, so that's my slides on reviewing your finances in COVID-19. Um, as I say, it will be around for questions at the end. Um, and on that, I'll pass over to my colleague, Leonard Burney. Thank you. Leonard? What are the odds, eh? Hello everybody, we've had to do a quick computer change. Apologies for the interruption. Can you all hear me? Yeah, brilliant. So I'm Leonard Burney, one of the Chartered Financial Planners at MHA Tate Walker Wealth Management. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on your retirement plans. Could I have the next slide, please? So revisiting your goals and objectives, you know, this is a really important one and Jeff covered this quite a bit in his part of the presentation now. When we're saying recover and revisit your goals and objectives, what we're talking about is what is your one single most overriding objective when it comes to your retirement? What do you want to achieve in retirement? Is it the date you retire? Is it the amount of money you need each year to get through retirement at certain points? Or is it the number of holidays you plan on having in retirement? Is it two, three holidays, four holidays per year? All those goals are really important. And what's really important about those goals is you have to attach a number to those goals because that's what's going to give you context about actually how much money you need in retirement. Reviewing your personal budget is a key part of that. So reviewing your personal budget, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're pre-retirement, if you haven't retired, how much money do you physically have coming into your household each month? And on top of that, how much is going out in essential expenditure, as Jeff talked about? So for example, if you have £2,000 coming in every month and you're spending 1500 on essentials and lifestyle spending, there's 500 pounds spare there. Are you able to save that? And how are you saving that? And are you saving that efficiently? And that's obviously something that you either can take on yourself and save personally, or you can speak to a professional and they'll advise you on where to put your money to get the best results. Now, reviewing your personal budget when you're actually in retirement is just as important. You need to understand what sources of income you have, where they're coming from, how they're taxed, and ultimately how you can achieve every single year the level of income you need to be able to do all the things you want to achieve in retirement. What do you have? How does it work and is it enough? So again, Jeff covered this in a little bit of detail with regards to pensions, but it's important to kind of think that retirement these days isn't just funded by pensions. It's funded by a combination of different sources of wealth. So it's pensions, it's ISAs, it's cash savings. Some clients actually think of their property as their retirement plan. What sources of income do you potentially have? How do they work? And can you get the money from them at the right time? You know, are you able to, for example, sell down on a property to downsize to release some equity potentially to actually pay for your retirement? All of these things need to be considered. 
do you have any mortgages or debt? What's your plan with this? You know, we always talk as financial planners to clients about actually, have you got any mortgages or debt moving into retirement? Because what a lot of clients prefer to do is they prefer to simplify their financial plan moving into retirement. They prefer to have no liabilities, no outgoings or anything like that that's around mortgages or debt and therefore just means that the income they're taking from investments or from guaranteed sources like the state pension are theirs to spend on lifestyle and on essential expenditure. Is it a good time to retire is a really difficult question. I actually spent a little bit of time thinking about how I've answered a couple of clients on this recently. And the answer is it depends. So if you're potentially thinking of retiring because you want to spend more time with family and loved ones, if you want to potentially, you know, change career or stop your career altogether, yes, it's potentially a good time to retire if the money works out. And this is a really important point. A lot of people's investments have been negatively affected by COVID-19 and they've actually got less in their pots than they actually previously had prior to March. Now, my question to those people would be, do you have other sources of income that you can utilize to get you through the next year or two whilst the markets calm down? Do you have a cash buffer? You know, do you have cash ISAs, national savings that you're willing to dip into? Because at the minute, if you were to use your investments to finance your retirement, you're potentially drawn from the investments whilst they're at somewhere close at the bottom of the market than they were previously. So they're worth less than they were previously. What I would be saying to clients is, have you got anything that else that you can take to give yourself time to recover? Okay. And then the final thing is, and this is probably the main thing that we do as financial plans for clients, is we, we, we provide a lot of context. So if a client comes to me and says, I don't understand what my number is, I don't know what my number is for me to be able to retire today to actually have enough money in retirement to get me from age 60 to age 100, hypothetically. So what we do for those clients is we do an exercise which is called lifetime cash flow modeling. So could I have the next slide, please? I've done two very simplistic cash flow models. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk you through both of them. So the very first one that you're looking at now is a client who's in what's called accumulation. So they haven't retired yet and they're still building up their wealth in anticipation of retirement. They're currently 40 years of age. They've got 30,000 pounds in pensions at age 40 and they've got a desired retirement age of 60. Now between them and their employer, every single month they're putting in 500 pounds into their workplace pension. It's pretty simple. That, that individual might have £2,000 net income coming into the household every month and might spend 1500 at which point, you know, they're able to put quite a decent amount into pensions and or cash, and therefore the 500 contribution is fairly reasonable for them. And most importantly, point five is they've got a 20-year saving time frame. So from 40 to 60, they're able to save as much as they possibly can to give themselves a good shot at retiring at 60 with a decent level of income. Now, what I wanted this slide to do is provide a lot of context for you guys that are actually taking part of the webinar, because I understand a lot of you may have investments and might be worried about the effect of COVID-19 and market crashes and various things like that. So what I've actually done is for this individual over the next 20 years, I've used back tested historical data so I've looked at the investment market over 20 years for investments in general that would have between 20 and 60% equity exposure. We would call that a balanced equity exposure. We'd say that's fairly balanced and down the middle as far as risk. So for a balanced investment portfolio over 20 years, start at 30,000, which has 500 pounds going into it every single month, that is the back-tested journey that that client would have experienced, okay? Now, a big thing that I want to point you towards is around about age 58, you'll see there's a dip there. That is actually the 2008 financial crisis. That is when the markets crashed and, you know, people lost 20, 30 percent overnight. It was really, really horrible and very terrifying for people. But what hindsight shows us is quite remarkable, because if you were to look at age 59, that client after a year had recovered their capital and actually they were on course for a reasonably good retirement at age 60 again. So what this shows is 2008, COVID-19, big, big things for the market, a lot of volatility, a lot of scariness that's happening in the client's portfolios and a lot of worry and sleepless nights. But actually, when you provide context, these corrections do occur. Markets do go down. They also come back up. And actually, over the longer term, if you were to look at the last 20 years, historically, they've gone up more than they've gone down, which is why we use equity-backed investments when we're trying to grow our wealth over the longer term. Could I have the next slide, please? 
So Mr. Smith from the first slide, you know, he's now 60 years of age, so I've, I've um, aged him historically a little bit. So he's now in the decumulation phase of retirement. So he's 60, he's about to draw on his capital. And I just wanted to give everyone on the call an idea of how that might look. Now, it's quite linear. And what that means is it's not varied all of the time, but your own situations will be quite varied. And that's why it's important that you look on a year to year basis. But this very simplistic model for a 60 year old with 240,000 pounds in pensions at age 60, which by the way, is what you would have had had he followed the 20 year plan that we put in place in the previous slide. He's got a full state pension as Jeff talked about at age 66, which is providing him around about 9,000 pounds a year. And he's got income needs between 60 and 70 when he retires. The first 10 years of his retirement, he wants 20,000 pounds in his back pocket every single year for those 10 years. A lot of holidays planned, a lot of gifts that he's going to give to grandchildren, etc. All those things that we're probably thinking about as we're moving into retirement. Age 70 to 75, he's slowing down a little bit. He only needs 18,000, 2,000 less. Maybe he's taking one less holiday a year. This is pretty typical of clients that I see in retirement. And age 75 to 90, he needs about £15,000 a year because the age 75 clients tend to slow down a lot. They don't need as much income. They're not going on as many holders. All of those things are pretty relevant to a lot of the clients that I see. Now, what I've done in this example is, again, I've used 30 years of back-tested historical data, only this time I've chosen a low risk. So there's only about up to 35% equity exposure in there, which means 35% of company shares. This is what we would classify as low risk. There's not going to be an awful lot of growth there, but there's also not a lot of volatility. What this graph shows here is the green lines are essentially showing that that is the expenditure of the client. Now, as you can see, between 60 and 66, he's fully covering those six years from his pension. He's fully covering those from the actual pension savings he has. Now, 66, the blue line comes in, which is a state pension that's providing him £9,000 of capital each year, which actually means he only needs to find 11000 from investments. And then 70, 75, 18000 and that's 75 to 90, 15,000. And at the end of his life, at age 90 in this example, he still would have about 35,000 pounds left in today's terms. So what I would say is COVID-19 retirement plans, our stance on it as financial planners is, yes, it's a current issue. And yes, we're talking a lot to clients about it. But when you have a financial plan and that financial plan is potentially 20 or 30 years in the making, one year doesn't make the difference to that 30 year time frame. What we need to do is always plan for the longer term and just take the current day circumstances into account and actually really think, okay, has this made a difference to my retirement? Do I still have my number that's going to allow me to accomplish all the things I want in retirement? And with that, I'll pop back over to Mark Parkinson who will talk us through our Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonard. Can everybody hear me? I've, I've changed. Okay. okay. I, I, I want... Apologies. I'm just going to I'm going to go back into uh, the other office because it's echoing. I'll be one second. We have had one question that's come in, um, which Jeff will answer, but there is a question that's come on live. Um, what are your thoughts on any potential wealth tax to pay for the pandemic? And obviously it's an interesting question. I'm sure we've all read and listened to the media to uh, hear the sort of eye-watering numbers that have been talked about and how the UK economy is going to be able to pay, pay for the pandemic. And I, I read somewhere at the weekend that the, the FT, they were talking about that the cost or the UK deficit will be somewhere in the region of £340 billion. So undoubtedly, the Chancellor will be looking at uh, various measures uh, to pay for this, and undoubtedly tax rises are probably high on his agenda. Um, 
the simple ones are, would be income tax and whether they look to change the thresholds and, and the levels where people start earning high rate tax or, or, or additional rate tax. The one area I do feel that will come under intense scrutiny is the state pension. Uh, Jeff alluded to it earlier that um, the state pension for, for many people is very generous. And some of you will already know that in April this year, the state pension actually rose by 3.9%. And that's to do with uh, something that the coalition government introduced in 2010, uh, which was a triple lock guarantee, whereby the state pension would either go by inflation CPI, average weekly earnings, or um, the higher of a minimum of 2.5%. And the, the weekly earnings or the average earnings was 3.9% last July. And that's what was the trigger for the state pension to go by 3.9%. Um, in April. So that's one area that I have seen a lot of coverage on that the Chancellor will look to um, change that uh, because will that, will that be sustainable going forward? And there is talk at the moment that inflation will drop for a period. However, the, I think economists generally are fearing that inflation could turn the other way and rise rapidly. Um, so in answer to your question, uh, Michael Smith, I think, um, yeah, the, the government will will doubtly be looking at um, various measures of, of tax, income tax, state pension, and then the others are inheritance tax, pensions, allowances has always been on the agenda that um, for high rate taxpayers, it could be seen to be too generous for the levels that they can contribute to a pension. So will they use this as the opportunity to, to, to reduce that? So time will tell, but inevitably, I think tax rises uh, will come. With the caveat, I think the government are all under pressure to kickstart the economic recovery. So it, how they time it, it, it is going to be a challenge. Jeff, do you want to pick up the question that somebody asked around buy to lets? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so we had a question that came in ahead of the, the webinar. So the question was, what's the current expected climate for new buy to let mortgaging? Um, and that's that's a really good question and, and a hot topic, as it were. So um, from what we see, that the buy to let more, uh, mortgage market is still, still quite strong. Um, there is going to be a huge demand for this because what's expected and we're already seeing is the rental market. It's only going one way and it's certainly outstripping the demand in terms of first time buyers. The, the people looking for, for rented accommodation is it, just, just going up and up. So that buy to let uh, market, it's going to go from strength to strength. Um, one of the key things, though, in terms of the loan to values, um, Yes, there's a few small number of providers that will do 80% loan to value, but realistically, you, you need to be in, in that 75% and above environment to secure a good rate. Um, but certainly there's providers out there with the appetite. Uh, just looking this morning, some of the rates on a, a two-year two -year fixed uh, with 75% LTV, 1.5% uh, interest rates. Um, so... There, there's certainly an appetite out there um, and it's only going to go one way to, to ensure that that requirement and that need for, for rented accommodation uh, can be met. Uh, interestingly, and, and kind of linking back to the topic of today's webinar, there's actually expected to be a huge demand for rented accommodation on the back of relationship breakups during COVID-19. Um, so, yeah, not, not a happy thought, but uh, a, a reality, apparently, from uh, some of the projections that are being made. Thanks, Mark. OK, thanks, Jeff. And we'll now give people the opportunity. It's, it's coming up to 11.40. You've just got three or four more minutes. If anybody's got any questions that they would like to ask us, then please unmute and uh, ask us the question. Okay, um, 
I'll take it that we, we haven't got any uh, other questions. However, if anybody's got any individual questions that are personal to their own circumstances, then please do get in touch. We will send a, a, a follow-up email uh, to thank everybody and with further contact, contact details. As you can see, they are on the screen, um, but we will follow this up. Um, and if anybody wants an individual discussion, then clearly we're, we're happy to have that. So thank you very much for coming on the session. And um, we uh, will take any personal questions that you have. Thank you.